As the world is watching the semifinals in men's hockey at the Sochi Olympics, we're going to take a look back at the legendary USSR hockey program. Dominant, disciplined, and able to bring beauty to a brutal, to a brutal sport. The so-called Red Army team was a powerhouse throughout the 70s and 80s, and a new documentary profiles that time and the transition that came off the ice in the waning days of the Soviet Union. It really almost is, is like a ballet on the ice, right? Because they were a team that really focused on, uh, on the passing game and worked together as, uh, as a unit rather than just having it all be about an individual player. But, you know, who, uh, who do you think was responsible for some of that? And, and um, you know, and, and compared to the rest of the world and the other hockey teams that were out there at the time, how good were they? Well, in the late 40s, the Soviet, you know, basically Stalin <laughs> declared that, that the Soviet Union be the, the greatest sports nation in the world. And within roughly 10 years, they basically started winning, you know, majority of, of the medals. And so they really um, made it um, a decree to become the best in the world. And they ended up um, hiring a, a, co a coach, Anatoly Tarasov, who kind of developed this, uh, the Soviet system, and he kind of Canadian started hockey, and I think uh, Tarasov really kind of brought a whole new perspective on the game, bringing you know kind of studying the Bolshoi ballet and chess, and and he had a lot of sort of creative instincts to, to revolutionize the game, and um, along with his sort of legendary um, training methods that were were very creative and kind of he isolated to the team in the woods outside of Moscow and, and trained them and, uh, together and ended up producing amazing results. And from there, you know, it kind of became uh, this, this sort of Soviet sports tradition that uh, became very successful in the, in the 70s and 80s, the most dominant uh, hockey team in the world for, for over 10 years. But at the same time, uh, you know, as you show there, it was – Pretty grueling conditions that these players were uh, were playing and were training under, especially after the loss in Lake Placid in 1980. Um, you know, after that, they they said that they were essentially at camp for 11 months out of the year and maybe would get one weekend off uh, a month, and so they never got to see their family. These guys really became like their own family because of that. But do you think that um, that that paid off, or do you think that history has shown that you know maybe some of that took it? A little bit too far. Yeah, well, I think you know, and any time you kind of, especially in, with team sports, any time you kind of isolate uh, people away from their families, I think there's definitely a price to pay for that. Obviously, you, you make tremendous sacrifices, and you know, under under conditions that are frankly kind of oppressive. But at the same time, I mean, beautiful. Um, some of the basically best hockey we've ever seen, you know, came out of it. So there is a price to pay, but at the same time, I think they created something that, you know, will, might never kind of be eclipsed in that they, they worked so well together. They knew each other so well and, and, and were able to create masterpiece uh, because they kind of knew each other so well. And the team sports, it's really important that, that you know, that instinctually you, you know where your teammates are and what they're doing, and you only do that through through kind of being together all the time and that familiarity. So I think that that really uh, gave them an advantage as well.